Before I introduce, before I introduce Dr. Asa Labaski, I, I want to thank Rabbi Levine for his strong support of our series on the Israeli soldiers' religious and ethical dimensions, and for all the hard work by Bernard Falk uh, for putting this all together. Uh, we appreciate Aaron Strom's uh, behind-the-scenes help with the Zoom link and publicity. I also want to remind everyone that this Sunday, uh, Professor Amichai Cohen is a very well-known uh, expert on uh, international law uh, from Israel, uh, will be delivering another Zoom talk on uh, Sunday at, at 10 o'clock in the morning uh, that will discuss the IDF Code of Ethics, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, requirement not to obey, obey unlawful orders, etc. So um, as you'll discover in just a few minutes, uh, Dr. Asel Labatsky is an extraordinary man. Um, his book, Min HaMidbar V'Halevanon, which is available uh, both in Hebrew and, if you'd like, in the English translation, um, uh, uh, has been for generations of religious Zionist youth, the touchstone work about how to integrate one's personal commitments with the soldier's duties. Uh, there's a long history of writing uh, from the trenches. Uh, for Americans, Tim O'Brien's The Things They Carried, <laughs> about the Vietnam War was the most canonical of these works. But Dr. Lebowski's book is not like O'Brien's. It is not filled with phantasmagorical passages. And it's not like the famous Israeli novel by his teacher at uh, his yeshiva in Malaya Dumim, Rav Chaim Sabato, to Um Kavanot, Adjusting Sites, which is a medley of autobiography and fiction, kind of auto fiction, um, uh, uh, which has become more popular these days, but was less popular when Chaim uh, Ralph Chaim Sabato uh, wrote his work. Dr. Lebowski tells in short, very descriptive passages how he entered the army, trained a platoon, and was seriously wounded in a battle in Lebanon during the 2006 war, an injury which he must, which, with which he must still contend. This is a book that keeps its boots solidly on the ground. Uh, Gita and I have known uh, Dr. Lebowski uh, for many, many years. Um, if I had to identify one overwhelming characteristic it would be his focus, his focus in learning at the Hesder uh, Yeshiva Birkat Moshev Malayo Demim, his focus as a commander, um, his remarkable self-discipline during a very long recovery at uh, the Tel Shomer Hospital, uh, and his focus as a physician and a PhD molecular biologist. Uh, his research on CFDNA as a cancer marker is pathbreaking. His, uh, he's currently a fellow in Toronto, we're here to learn about how a soldier should respond in the midst of battle. Dr. Lebowski quotes the Rambam at one point where he says, a soldier must enter into battle with all his consciousness. In many ways, this book is a description, a sort of how-to guide of, of, of how to do that. Uh, but being whole, complete, and fully conscious of the many dimensions of warfare is, if you read the book, impossible to distinguish for the religious soldier from his or her sense of religious obligation. Early in, uh, from the wilderness in Lebanon, uh, Asael, uh, he's not yet a physician, uh, consults Rav Nachum uh, Rabinovich, the Rosh Hashiva at Birkat Moshe uh, in Malio Demim, about how to keep mitzvot in the army. Rav Rabinovich tells him that all of his attention be directed just towards performing the military duties. Yet this is what Dr. Lebowski writes. I behaved as on a weekday. This was a Shabbat. I behaved as on a weekday, but I wanted to know the time. I didn't light up my watch dial, but I held the watch close to the dashboard, reading the time by its light. It was only a small change, but it helped remind me that today was Shabbat. Every war has its own chroniclers. The Six Day War was followed by a book, Siach uh, Lochamim, the seventh day. Uh, where kibbutznik soldiers after the war described their anguish over the cost of the war to civilians. Rav Sabato's Adjusting Sites, written in the wake of the Yom Kippur War, contrasts the logic of, logic, of Talmud study with the illogic of war. But Dr. Lebowski's book assumes that the sites do not need to be adjusted. There just needs to be focus. He participated in a military operation called Mitzah Kore Plada, the Operation um, Steel Web, was a reference to Nasrallah's comment that Israel was simply a fragile spider's web that could be easily blown away. Its people had become soft, feckless, unmoored, too modern. Um, 
but if you read this book, um, it's the strength of character uh, described in the book that shows that the web is, is truly uh, made of steel. So um, I, I could give you many examples of the book where he, where he shows what it means to have a sense, a complete sense of what it means to be a soldier. But um, I wanna turn over um, the microphone to Dr. Lebowski and, and thank him many, many thanks for joining us. He's, I know he's incredibly busy uh, and now I'll say it's, it's all yours. Wow, thank you very much for this amazing introduction. Um, I feel humble. Uh, so thank, firstly, thank you very much for having me uh, in this uh, special series, uh, series about the Israel in crisis. And I would say that I'm like, very excited to see both of you, uh, Stephen and uh, Gita, here uh, through virtually through the Zoom, but uh, uh, Gita and Steve, Steven are both uh, uh, very close, uh, long-standing friends of my uh, parents. And if I consider myself also as their friend, I would, would be delightful to be considered as well. And as uh, you, you mentioned, you know me probably as a young child, maybe even preschool years, so uh, more than uh, 35 years. So I'm very humbled and very excited uh, to join you here tonight. Um, so I, I think I would start with like a, a self-reflection uh, and maybe, maybe like telling my personal story. And maybe from that, uh, would, I would uh, be delighted to address or answer any other uh, questions or discussions regarding the current war. And of course, I'm not a military ex um, uh, expert. I have my own uh, experience, uh, but I, I do feel that in those days, um, we all uh, reflect and all think about the war in Gaza. I can probably try to shed some light uh, from my personal perspective. Um, so when, whenever I speak in those days, I, I think that's one thing that you always have to remember. And be, I'm sure it's like uh, very deep in all our hearts. Uh, like first and foremost, we always like, we request our condolences to all the families who uh, have endured the loss of their loved ones. Unfortunately, um, I know some of them. And one of my commanders from the Second Lebanon War who continued in the army as a brigadier commander and was uh, killed in the first day. And while we all hope for the release of those held hostage in Gaza and pray for our soldiers fighting uh, uh, there day and night. And going back to my personal story, so uh, almost 18 years ago, uh, I was a young officer in the Golani Brigade. I served as a platoon commander, meaning that I was uh, commanding about uh, 30 soldiers in the Golani Brigade. It's an infantry brigade. Um, my soldiers were pretty young soldiers, like they were in the first year of their service. And just after completing uh, their um, final uh, uh, tra uh, trainee, uh, we heard in the radio that something happened in Gaza. That was one of the first uh, Hamas attacks in those days. This was the capture of Gilad Shalit. That was almost 18 years ago, 2006. Um, but uh, as we know how things unfolded uh, later on, this uh, attack and this uh, capture of Gilad Shalit in many ways has a lot of unfortunately implications uh, to our days, including the later release of Yechi uh, Sinwar, Sinwar in the exchange for Gilad Shalit. Um, back then, an Israeli captured by Hamas, a soldier or any Israeli, it was a, a rare theme, and nowadays, uh, unfortunately, uh, we know we have uh, so many others. But we, on the same day, were called to fight in Gaza. And so our uh, company uh, drove directly to the area, to the Ashkelon area, and we started, uh, after a few days, fighting inside Gaza. I think when I, I don't really compare, but sometimes I do think about some differences between the fight, the fight today in Gaza and uh, our days, I think in our days, fighting in Gaza was easier. Like in, in many ways, um, we thought Lebanon was uh, more severe, but in Gaza back then, uh, Hamas was just like in the beginning of their um, being involved there in Gaza. Uh, we didn't have so many encounters, so many like anti-tank missiles. And once we came in with armored vehicles, we felt most of the time relatively safe. Um, so uh, when we fought in Gaza, we didn't have so many casualties in those days. Uh, but in one of the events, um, seven of my soldiers were injured, most of them lightly, but one of them severely injured uh, while fighting in Gaza. Um, 
While we were fighting in Gaza, another event happened in the north, and this is, was the capture of two Israeli soldiers to in, into Lebanon by the Hezbollah terrorists. And and like we had like for the first time for many years, uh, two different areas to fight in: one in Gaza, second uh, in Lebanon. And I'm saying this because we are like discussing the uh, the whole in these days, same issues again. Would it be, become like a a double folded uh, war in the bo both directions besides of course the the uh, Palestinians in Israel would it become like another full war in Lebanon or not so the same I think in many ways similar uh, considerations were uh, felt back then in 2006 so after fighting a few days in Gaza and uh, as I told you some of my soldiers were injured there in uh, one of the towns in, in uh, El Atatra that many of those towns now became more uh, familiar, more famous. Um, that's when I finished the fighting in Gaza. I went to, directly to Tel Shomer, to Sheba Medical Center, uh, to come and visit one of my wounded soldiers, who was um, the most severe uh, uh, one of them. He, he sustained a uh, cervical spine injury, uh, which we were all concerned that he uh, become uh, paralyzed. So thanks God, even though he had a uh, severe injury there, yeah, there was no neurological deficit, so he, he was not paralyzed from that. So we had to go through a lengthy rehabilitation process uh, to gain some more power, but he didn't have any like, long-term uh, this um, devastating consequences. But back then, I was not a doctor, I was not a medic. I came to the hospital, and I won't forget this situation where I came into this uh, neurosurgical uh, ICU intensive care unit, meeting uh, my soldier's parents and talking about their son who is now intubated in the ICU and uh, going through medical procedures. And as a commander, as a young commander, trying to tell them about the event itself, but also looking in, into their eyes deeply and trying to think, what do they think? Do they blame me, the IDF? Are they sorry that, that they sent him to become a combat soldier? I was a young commander back then, uh, first time that I had like uh, one of my soldiers wounded under my uh, role. And it's a difficult uh, situation. I mean, you, you never know how the family will react. How would you yourself uh, go with that? And all the situation of like being wounded, being a, a commander of someone being wounded, all this was pretty new to myself. Um, and uh, I thought back then I never had, you know, like any significant discussions pre the war like we didn't have any i don't know like uh, um consults regarding that or i, I think nowadays the people are like more aware and that idf is more to that but i don't think even we haven't even talked about ptsd how to deal with the wounded soldiers uh, casualties it was all new for all of us while i was there in this uh, visiting him and speaking to the family i got another phone call from a company commander telling me that we are leaving Gaza and we are going to the north to fight in Lebanon. Back then, when we heard the word Lebanon, it meant for us a new era, a different place to fight in. I personally had the experience fighting in Gaza in the past and uh, had uh, extensive experience fighting in other cities in the West Bank, uh, but I never fought in Lebanon. It was not my generation who fought there. It was like uh, previous uh, soldiers, previous uh, commanders, uh, back uh, in, in the uh, 1990s. Uh, so when we heard the word Lebanon, I don't think we encountered the the, the phrase war uh, back then yet. But we know it's something else. It's like, it should be like a big military operation, something that uh, in a different in different scale that we haven't encountered yet. So we went to the north, uh, prepared our um, uh, troops, and after a few days, entered uh, Lebanon. All my soldiers and myself were excited. We felt we were doing like something significant, crossing the Israeli-Lebanese uh, border and entering uh, Lebanon. So after we heard a lot of uh, shouting and uh, firing around us, and we actually encountered battles uh, in the entrance of the uh, Binjbel. After two days of fighting there, we thought we finished our first mission there. And the orders said that we had to disengage uh, this area and come back to the Israeli border. But then just a few hours before we did it, we got new orders, uh, vice versa, like not going back to Israel, but 
uh, attacking a new place in the center of uh, Binjbel. Binjbel is like a large uh, town, uh, pro uh, Hezbollah town in the southern uh, Lebanon area that we knew from the intelligence that uh, multiple uh, Hezbollah terrorists are hiding there. Uh, back then, we didn't know that it actually it was like a, a special uh, forces, special commando forces of the Hezbollah who were trained, trained back uh, in Iran uh, recently. So we came in into uh, Binj Bel, all our battalion with other forces uh, assisting us to enter the center of Binj Bel. And the first company who tried to enter the, those houses was Company C. Uh, led by my close friend, Amichai Merchavia, another platoon commander from our battalion. Amichai tried to break into the first uh, house, uh, but to no avail, the house was uh, severely locked. He tried to break in using some uh, special uh, grenades, and while attempting to do that, everything became uh, on fire. Once the terrorists heard uh, those explosions, they started to fire back. And one of the gunners, Amichai's uh, gunner, uh, saw someone approaching them. This guy didn't have a helmet. He had a long beard and he had a different uh, type of weapon. This was a Hezbollah terrorist. This is how the um, uh, Battle of Binjbel started. That was in Rosh uh, Chodesh Av, uh, first day of Av, um, almost 18 years ago. And the battle uh, was uh, for more than 10 hours with uh, multiple casualties. And after Amichai Merchavia heard this uh, uh, firing, he uh, took his soldiers, led them to fire back against the terrorists. They climbed on the first wall and they striked against those terrorists. While doing that, um, they were shot from the side. Amichai felt severely wounded. We can only hear him in the radio telling us that he was uh, wounded. Major Roy Klein, the deputy um, commander of our battalion, Major Roy Klein, decided to assist there. He threw a few grenades over the wall and uh, climbed into this area, trying to evacuate all the wounded soldiers from this area in this uh, battlefield in the yard. Roy Klein ordered one of the guys to open a stretcher. They put a Michai on the stretcher. Um, four people, including uh, Roy Klein, were holding the stretcher and trying to evacuate Amichai Merchavia from this area. And then suddenly a hand grenade was thrown uh, from, from the side. This hand grenade uh, landed less than uh, one feet from uh, Major Roy Klein. He understood very well what could be the consequences of such an explosion in the middle of the yard when more than a dozen soldiers are in. And Roy Klein decided to sacrifice his own life by jumping on the grenade, muffling it by his own body, and thus uh, saving the lives of all of his soldiers in the yard. I do want to tell you what Roy Klein did in the aftermath. After he jumped on the grenade, he was still alive for a very short time. Um, and whenever I, like, I, I, I tell this story, I, I don't remind myself, I just like... Uh, Let's, let's tell it uh, um, like reading it from somewhere. Uh, Roy Klein in his last minutes was able to take out from his uh, from his pouch, from the vest, um, his uh, special radio device that cannot be fallen into the enemy's uh, hands, gave it to another commander, spoke in the radio, tried to tell us Klein met, Klein is dead, like telling us that he's going to be dead in any second, and cried, Shema Israel, Hashem Elokein, Hashem Echad. This is how Major Roy Klein sacrificed his life. He was killed there in the Battle of Binge Bell. Roy Klein was one of eight um, of our comrades who were killed in this uh, battle. And, but the battle continued, as I told you, for over 10 hours with multiple casualties. More than uh, 25 were injured and eight were killed in this battle. Back in those moments, I heard uh, he was there. I didn't know what was the condition of Amichai, did he survive or not. And we got the orders to try to assist, uh, to help fight there and evacuate both the wounded and the casualties from uh, this uh, fire, from this attack. Although it was a, a very like severe like and heavy uh, fire with eight casualties, um, our men uh, were uh, fighting greatly there were able to kill uh, more than uh, 40 Hezbollah terrorists who later on uh, evacuated also 
dead bodies of the terrorists. So we can count them. More than 40 of them were killed there. But, but at a very heavy price. Every person, every Jewish man is olamum lo'o. So when you encounter eight casualties in one uh, battle, it was very uh, heartbreaking. I came in with my soldiers. I had a short time to speak with them just before entering this uh, battlefield. And I told them I feel that this is a holy mission. Holy because we have now the last chance to carry out those uh, wounded and dead bodies to have a, a chance to bury them in a Jewish cemetery back in Israel. And we came in. Uh, I will never forget those uh, eight stretchers uh, underground. It's uh, two of us took one stretcher and, and, and started our um, journey. We called it like the, our way to participate in the funeral of those uh, casualties from the Battle of Binge Bell. During the evacuation, um, I suddenly saw that one of the stretchers was not uh, like holding well one of the uh, bodies. I ordered one of my men to put the stretcher on the ground while, while the other, while the gunners and the snipers were uh, covering on us. I opened the, the blanket and tried to cover back and tie again the body and the stretcher. Um, while doing that, I, to my horror, suddenly saw that I'm holding... Uh, the head of my close friend, Amichai Merchavia. I didn't know in advance what was his condition, uh, but unfortunately, I, I learned that Amichai was dead. I felt like a crater opening in my heart. But at the same time, I also knew that I'm now um, leading um, 30 soldiers from the middle of Binjbel back to the Israeli-Lebanese border, more than uh, three miles. Um, I have to navigate it. I have to give the right orders. I have to be very focused, as Stephen said earlier. And you kind of, like, in a way, like uh, this uh, arm yourself, like you think about what is the um, greatest, what is the best way to overcome this condition. I felt this greater in my, in my heart, but I knew I had to focus. I have to now be uh, with all my heart and all my uh, concentration in the battlefield and continue to order them. And my like my soldiers told me later on that they saw that something like occurred to me, uh, definitely. But I had to like, focus on there. I, I started the orders. I continued to navigate, looked in the map, and continued this line, the journey and the, the funeral of, of our uh, comrades from uh, Binsville back to Israel. We came to the border and we gave the dead bodies to the uh, IDF rabbis. And soon after, we had to come back in to fight in Lebanon. I do remember yeah, that when we came back to uh, Lebanon after the after the Battle of Binge Bell, something has changed. Um, maybe our uh, beards grew up in a few days, but we matured in, in many years. I saw it in the eyes of my uh, soldiers. We all felt that we are fighting for something meaningful, but it could be um, uh, harmful. Uh, in the beginning, sometimes, you know, some of my soldiers were came in, you know, like, enthusiastic. They are, like, young soldiers. They want to have, like, the X and the, um, uh, the gun, like, saying that we kill terrorists. But now people, like, consider it more in a mature way, understanding that it's, uh, it's a meaningful. It, we're doing it for our country, for the Jewish nation. But it's very, it is very risky. Um, as it happened to our, our comrades from uh, platoon uh, from Company C, it can happen to anyone, uh, to everyone else. So I do remember like the fighting since the Battle of Binge Bell in the upcoming uh, two weeks, uh, more meaningful in many ways, more meaningful conversations with my soldiers. But one of my uh, sources for power were my soldiers and uh, my comrades. We felt, even though they understand the risks of those emissions, had the power to overcome it and continue to fight in uh, Lebanon. I think in the sake of time, I will like, jump to my my last day fighting in uh, Lebanon. And after a few more um, battles in uh, Lebanon, um, in my last day of fighting in Lebanon, we entered uh, again the same area of uh, Binge Bell. Uh, this time we came in armored vehicles. I was uh, 39. And after about uh, two miles into uh, Lebanon, heard in the radio that uh, the commander and uh, the platoon commander 
who leads the war was not sure about the right path, how to enter uh, Bin's belly. He was a tank commander. I wanted to help him, but in my vehicle, in my armored vehicle, the only way that I could see the battlefield was if I opened my cabin and took my head out because we were like driving uh, uphill. So I did something which uh, relatively is not really done in Lebanon to open the cabin and like take your upper body out of the cabin. This way I could see the battlefield very well, but I was exposed. And after saying one or two words in the radio, I saw something from, from the distance who looked to me like a huge explosion and then like following it, a fireball approaching uh, our uh, convoy. In the first second, I wasn't sure if they were shooting on my vehicle, maybe in uh, one of the other vehicles, but I didn't have time to think about it. This uh, advanced uh, anti-tank missile directly hit my vehicle, penetrated the armor, and I felt a huge explosion and something that was like uh, burning me from the lower part to the upper part of my body. I couldn't uh, hold my uh, myself on my legs. I was holding myself with the strength of my hands. I tried to speak in the radio, but to no avail. No one can hear me. I yelled to my gunner to fire back. And the second after it, uh, the other uh, teams in my uh, company understood that I was the one who was injured. I was the only one who didn't answer them. Actually, I was the only one who really saw the, um, uh, this anti-tank uh, missile uh, launch on us. So, I, so I, I was the one who understood what happened, but I couldn't uh, convey that to the other teams. But they understood I was the only one who didn't uh, respond. And they fired back and they saw that my vehicle was on fire. Another brave uh, officer came, uh, one of my closest friends, uh, Achikam, came in. He tried to evacuate us from the vehicle. Two of my men were with me in the vehicle. Both of them were injured, but uh, moderate and uh, mildly injured. I was uh, critically injured in this uh, event. So both of them were able to climb out of the vehicle, of the burning vehicle, and they had to um, take me out and uh, put, put me in a stretcher running back uh, downhill from this uh, area where the other uh, commanders were continuing to fight against the terrorists. And the clash uh, became like a big clash against the Hezbollah terrorists who were continuing to fire on our, us and our, our guys were firing back. They put me on a stretcher and while evacuating me downhill, I suddenly felt like a severe pain in my uh, right uh, leg. I couldn't see very well, uh, my uh, vision was sorrow, but I did see like my right leg like falling from the stretcher. I yelled to one of my men to put the leg back, but I was sure I lost my my uh, right leg, hoping that my left leg uh, would be spared. He continued to evacuate me from there, and later on I, I, I just realized that actually in this uh, battle, I was uh, hit by anti-tank missile directly in the center of the vehicle. If I was standing, if I was sitting at the, at the moment, no chance I would be here to tell you this story. And my vest was ripped to two parts and everything is totally there. So uh, if I was sitting, I would be hitting my head and the chest, uh, no, no chance. But hundreds of, of those sharpnel hit my legs. This is how uh, my life was saved. Although uh, I sustained, um, so, um, very severe injuries. Um, very bravely, my men who continued to evacuate me from this battlefield to the border. A helicopter came in, couldn't land because of the heavy fire there. I do remember that once the helicopter landed at the Israeli-Lebanese border, um, I was uh, thrown into this helicopter with my soldiers. I was really um, relieved to see that both of them, although were injured, were still functioning and could come with me in the helicopter. As their commander, I, I would feel really bad if they would stay in the in this uh, border. I remember when once the helicopter took off, I understood I'm starting now a new battle. Not a war that you fight against terrorists, not a battle that you fire back, use a weapon and uh, evacuate wounded soldiers, but a whole different battle that in many ways started almost 18 years ago, but continues on a daily basis. This is the battle of rehabilitation, a battle to come back to life, to overcome the multiple surgeries down the road, to try to walk again, to have a normal life, although I didn't know back then what I'm going to have to cope with later on, I already knew 
in those moments when the helicopter took off, I'm starting now a new battle. I'm not going to go and come and fight back in the second Lebanon war, but I'm starting now a new battle. And then like I had like a pause because once I got to the hospital, I was directed directly to the operation, uh, OR operation room. Um, and then I was like sedated in the ICU for a few days. Um, so I just like, I got, got filled in for my family after it, but uh, my my parents only heard in the beginning that I was lightly injured. I think that the uh, first uh, information they knew that a, a sharpness of a missile hit my leg. So actually a whole missile hit me directly. But in a way, it was for uh, for the good of it because then my parents could like overcome it easily or in an easier way. He started to drive to the north, found me in the hospital, you know, got like... Uh, uh, stepwise the uh, the bad news and they heard that I was still functioning when I got the hospital I, I gave the numbers and my IDs so they knew that I didn't, didn't sustain any like severe brain injury so I think this also helped them to cope in the upcoming days when I was sedated in the ICU so I, I think I, I, I spoke maybe like for a longer time than I planned about my um like personal encounters from the war itself. Um, but I, I think now I want to share with you some of my thoughts and insights from those times, not in a chronological uh, way, but more about like those times because I spent a very long time in the hospital after my injury. Um, I was hospitalized for over a year, uh, 14 months in the hospital with uh, multiple about like 15 uh, major surgeries and a lot of other procedures. And it gives you like a long time, uh, not only, only to think about your, your life, uh, but also to get some uh, perspective and some uh, reflections um, about all those events. And uh, we might uh, see some of those uh, thoughts may be relevant also to these times when uh, our IDF uh, soldiers are fighting in Gaza and we are, have encountered what we have encountered in the, those uh, passing uh, months. So one thing I, I felt like very significant from the beginning is the um, meaningfulness of, of being part of something bigger than, than your own life. Um, I would say in a relative way, that I think, I mean, anyone uh, in, in our lives, we all encounter difficulties, we all have to overcome challenges and it could be um, physical, uh, mental, medical ones and others. And we all have to counter them. And uh, always like when I speak to young guys, I always tell them that, that you know, I tell you a, like a small secret. I'm not the only one in the room who have uh, who has, you know, like a, a disability or, or challenges. But the question is not what, what is your challenges, more like uh, how do you cope with them? And uh, one of the things I really felt gave me a lot of strength and resilience in those days is the meaningfulness, is the significance of being part of the Jewish nation fighting for their life. Um, and I, I really felt it, like um, not in like in a cliche way, but um, in those days, back in those days in the hospital, I spent there, as I told you, like about 14 months, not even one single day in, during those days, I haven't had someone to come to visit me excluding my immediate family and close friends. Like for months and months on a daily basis, people came, some of them never knew me. Some of them were like uh, not immediate family or not relatives or very far away um, um, friends or even people that never met me or anyone in the army. People constantly came with us and kind of like gave us the biggest hug we can and gave us the huge embrace from the Jewish diaspora and the Israel nation that we support you, we are, you are a part of something bigger. You kind of felt that, you, I really felt it in those days, that uh, my men and myself and my commanders, we fought for our country, we fought for the Jewish nation. Not, not as it was like a general statement, and uh, we were fighting not in Vietnam or in the Middle East, uh, far away from US, we fought on the Israeli borders. I came in and out from, uh, Lebanon, uh, from Lebanon to uh, Israeli soil, multiple times. I saw the places in the, in the towns, in the villages in the north, which were mainly like uh, personalized by military personnel and almost no citizens are going, going through, going in those days there. So you really felt you were fighting for something bigger. And this gave me a lot of resilience, feeling that you are part of something bigger. And I would say that another thing that uh, 
also helped me to cope in many ways with the perspective. Um, unfortunately, uh, we now see it even more, but even back then, uh, many of my uh, comrades uh, were killed in those battles. Uh, personally, like eight of our uh, um, soldiers from my uh, battalion were killed, eight of them in the battle I told you earlier on. So whenever I had like the encounter with the, the bereaved families, I always felt again and again that my life was saved. I mean, of course, uh, I, I sustained uh, uh, severe injuries, life-sustaining injuries that would impact my life in many ways. But I also felt that I, it was a miracle. Like every year when the when the time comes, when we like to be have the, my uh, injury day uh, comes, it's, it's like an ongoing discussion with my wife, Avital. How do we celebrate it, memorize it, um, do a meaningful thing? Because at, at, at on the one hand, like this is my day, that, uh, like the, it's a miracle. This is my day that my my life was saved. On the other hand, like, you know, I always remember in those days, my friends were killed. I myself became disabled for all my life. So do you celebrate it? Do you mention it? Do you, how do you uh, commemorate those days? It's an ongoing discussion and there's no one solution. But I think it just like uh, tells us in a way that our um, all our memories from those days are always like mixed feelings between uh, between those uh, aspects. And... Even even more than that, I would say that uh, one of the things that really uh, made me feel like part of something bigger is uh, when I encountered the, the uh, stories from my family were related uh, to my condition. So I would want to share with you like another short story from my grandfather uh, story. I'm sure Stephen and Gitten uh, know what I'm talking about. Um, so I, I'll tell you shortly about my grandfather, Isa Lubotsky. He's my father's father, who was born in uh, Vilnius. And back then, uh, it was between Poland and Lithuania, and grew up uh, in between the uh, world wars. And when the, 1939, when the Germans invaded uh, uh, Poland, he, he ran away with some of his uh, teams fighting, trying to fight there. And later on, he became a underground uh, fighter in the Vilnius ghetto. He managed to join uh, the FPO, the partisan uh, um, underground fighting against the Germans there, and even uh, evacuated themselves on the last day of the ghetto before the ghetto was liquidated through the sewage tunnels, uh, through the forest, and became a partisan fighter against the Nazis. That was all in the 1940s, more than uh, 80 years ago. One of the days as a partisan fighter, my grandfather fought against a pro-German uh, military a group. And in this fight, my grandfather was injured, severely injured. He was hit by a bullet in, in his leg, in his right leg, the leg that I, I, I almost uh, lost, and was evacuated by his uh, fellow partisans to the partisan camp. Now think about 1943, a partisan camp, there's almost no uh, medical aid. Uh, his uh, wound became infected. He was almost in, like, in a preceptive condition. His chances to survive it were very, very low. And actually, his fellow partisans even dug their hole, um, thinking about to bury him once he's going to pass away in the partisan camp. And the story could have ended uh, at, at this uh, place. But, however, uh, there was a Jewish nurse partisan who did whatever she can, by all means, to try to save my grandfather's life. He, she treated him with uh, leaves. He didn't have any bandages. And somehow they even managed to uh, capture from a German train some antibiotics. Prontos are the first like, uh, merchandised antibiotics back then. And miraculously, my grandfather uh, survived. His wound has healed, and he even continued to fight later on in uh, uh, in Vilnius, and also as a Irgun officer later back in Israel, and uh, even as an Golani a soldier in the in the independence war. Mm -hmm. Sixty years later, when my grandfather came to visit me at the hospital at uh, Sheba Tel Shomer, we were sitting there. I was like back then, like in my bed, severely injured sitting there with my some of my family members and some of my doctors there. And my grandfather told this whole story, a story which I heard multiple times in, in my life uh, about uh, how he was injured and how this nurse uh, saved his life. 
that back then he revealed one new detail that I never heard in, in advance, I never heard before. When he finished the story, he looked at all of us and suddenly asked, do you know who was this Jewish news partisan who saved my life? And to our astonishing faces, he looked at Dr. Zivner, my orthopedic surgeon, and told him that was your mother, Anka. So the Jewish news partisan who saved my grandfather's life was the mother of my doctor treating me 60 years later back in Israel. And I, we, we all like cried there and there we, we all felt that this is like the closure of uh, the Jewish nation from the uh, most terrific, uh, horrific times of the Holocaust, World War II, where millions of our nation were uh, killed with all the atrocities by the Nazis to uh, the, the, our day that when we uh, established our own country where, where we can come and fight for our uh, families, for our country, and for our uh, nation. And reflecting back on those days uh, and today and the soldiers fighting in uh, Gaza, I'm sure they're having very difficult times. And I, I know from many of them personally, I speak to multiple of them like around the week. And unfortunately, some of my friends were injured and my, my wife's cousin was severely injured in one of the uh, rescue attempts uh, for the hostages. But the spirit is very strong, and I and I really feel it. Uh, even though I like this year, I'm I'm far away. I live in Toronto till the end of the year. But whenever I speak to my colleagues, my friends, uh, and people back in Israel, and also wounded soldiers, who I try to give them some like a long distance uh, overview of what of some of the challenges that can 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 uh, they have going to have to go through. I really feel that uh, they, they, they really like they feel the embrace from the nation. They feel that they are part of something bigger. And I think like after October 7, uh, no uh, like Jewish man or Israeli person can, can stay aside. We all feel uh, those emotions and people feel that this is our uh, way. To, to give back, to be part of something uh, bigger. And people pay prices, definitely. Um, families of the buried families pay higher, high, extremely high prices. Um, families of the hostages, I cannot even bear in mind uh, those uh, feelings. Um, but we know that there are ways to overcome. And like, even in those days, I feel that uh, even in those, like that darkness of those days, there is like a light that, uh, like, emerges uh, from the darkness and is capable for overcoming the cruelty and the evil. And I feel like the unity, the generosity and the heroism that we hear and witness uh, in all of those days um, can make us you know, navigate this crisis and in a way I hope even emerge from it even uh, stronger. So when I reflect to those sort of some of it, I always tell them it's a big challenge we have a lot uh, to encounter, but there is a path, I hope, uh, to overcome uh, some of those uh, things. Um, I do remember, like, I, I spoke to one of my friends uh, a few days ago, and he asked me, like, uh, how do you overcome all the pain? I still suffer from pain, but he said, you know, I, when you ask me that, I remember I, I sustained, like, severe pain do, during the rehab process between the surgeries and that. But I don't, I don't have like you know like the memory of the pain itself. I just I remember it as a more like, like as a, like, uh, like as a data. I remember it was that it was really painful. That was very hard. But we have probably like some of, uh, some of our, um, I would say ways to cope with the severe pain in our life and uh, hard memories. Is to overcome them, and we don't always remember it. And I'm sure uh, Gita can uh, explain more about those uh, emotional processes. Yeah, but I, I I feel it like now not not as a doctor, not as a specialist, just you know as, a, as more from the patient side. That somehow you know as, as same as maybe you know women who bear a child, and then you know they always uh, uh, say that how how can they do it again? But you know there's like an also from the halachic way that maybe they. Like they, they survive, they're not going to do it again. But then again, people like for, uh, women like forget uh, the previous deliveries or forget the pain and do it again. So people do it again. People have the ways to cope uh, with it. So I really feel empowered for those young guys. I know they have like a long journey ahead of them, uh, but I, I really feel like the road for 
a meaningful life, a meaningful uh, journey is ahead of them and, and they are capable uh, for it. And another thing I told them that um, when I re reflect back to the, my days in the rehab center, although I'm sure I had like a very severe pain in those days and multiple challenges, I do see those days of uh, some of my, you know, my, my greatest days in my life. Like those are like very emotional, very meaningful days. Uh, some of my greatest connections to people, to myself, to my family, and were all uh, in a way um, started and grew, grew up in those days. So although they are challenging days, uh, they can go with them. And I feel that in, in a, that's like a microcosmos in a, in a similar way for us as a nation. And we have multiple challenges, but we can overcome them. And, you know, I kind of feel like I, I, mean, I know it's like Israeli crisis. This is like the series, but I spoke a lot about, you know, like crisis and like hard stuff and the things to remove from it. And I do want to say that, um, just to disclose that um, life continues. And uh, thankfully, I got to marry to my great uh, wife, Avital. And we have six kids. And nowadays, uh, every time one of our kids uh, is born, we feel Again, that we are like we are winning. This is a victory. Uh, although you know, so many uh, terrorists and the people want to have us being killed and out of this country, we uh, we survive. We only survive. We have our victories. And um, one of my sons was born exactly in the same like date of my injury, six years later, and we called him Navi uh, Michai Michai after my close friend Michai Michavia, saying that we are continuing. We are remembering those uh, who were fallen, but we continue to grow from those uh, days. So I really hope that although uh, people speak about a lot about like uh, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, I lately heard uh, that there's like a new term, uh, uh, post-traumatic uh, growth, so uh, um, PTG. So I really feel that sometimes after um, having a trauma, it could be like a national trauma as well, there could be also a growth from it. So although there's like a very severe cases and um, especially the October 7 uh, stories and atrocities are how to, how to embrace and how to even hear about them, I really believe that there is a way to grow from them, to have like post-traumatic growth uh, from those times, both on a personal and a national uh, level. This is my like desire and hope. So I think I spoke to him for a long time. Maybe uh, Dr. one of you. Uh, Doc, Dr. Lobotsky, I, I, I don't know if this is a comment or, or a question. You'll forgive me, but we're all overwhelmed and awed beyond comprehension by your, by your saga and your courage, your heroism and your message of growth. Um, what, 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 what I've been wondering is that the Chayalim of today followed a period of, of relative calm in Israel. Um, the, the, the Second Lebanon War was a few years after the Second Intifada. I've heard it said that this generation of Hayalim really came to this war out of a vacuum. But yet, it's astounding, and I think you reflected this, that the Hayalim, as one of my Israeli friends said, have an enormous amount of motivatia, which you said in other words. And... <clears throat> I, I hope this continues and you're giving us hope. And the second phase is how the nation can recover. <clears throat> I don't mean physically that too, of course, but <clears throat> as, in, as a unified country after this war, and then sort of expanding on that, <clears throat> how the nation can recover from the horrid anti-Zionism throughout the globe. And for that matter, <clears throat> that we feel here in anti-Semitism that we've never felt before you know what thoughts might you have in terms of israel coming out of the gaza war as opposed to coming out of the second lebanon war which was also horrific and had terrible consequences how does the nation heal after that how does how does that happen yeah, so great uh, comments or questions. So I can try to think. I mean, I don't have a crystal ball to really know, of course, but um, from what I encounter from people uh, around me, uh, both like from my family members and other people I speak to, I mean, we are all always like uh, gathered and united in, in, in crises. And, and I think our mission 
is to try to gather those uh, memories from the crisis days and to try to imply those uh, this unity that is still uh, held to the regular days and, and it's hard and I, I I can say like in both like in a personal reflection I remember that one of the things that really helped me is that, that perspective that you know that you even though I was injured I, I just told you earlier at least I was not killed but you cannot hold this perspective and a, on a daily moment to moment basis and everything happens I mean okay you, you can still spill a coffee and say oh my why did I spill this coffee although relatively to spilling this coffee is nothing but still you spill the coffee on, on your nice shirt so you can be for one moment uh, disappointed right so I, I don't expect like um, our nation and uh, our leaders at least even less, but even but uh, also like um, our young commanders to be in the same unity and in the same uh, motivation and emotional process that they have been through the following weeks after October seven. But I do think we, we have learned something, and uh, the, the 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 thing that has happened like between October six and October seven is so profound. I mean, unfortunately, we all know it. Like the the um. The fights in Israel like between us uh, people, like in the uh, marginalization in Israel pre October 7, was so bad and so concerning. All the Yom Kippur issues and all the things that happened in Israel just before October 7, we were so marginalized and, and so and so and so much uh, uh, having like those internal fights that I really hope that this change from the pre war and the, and the extreme work days. Would help something and tell us, okay, even though we, we had things to fight and, and they're still very significant and there are still, we have, you know, like uh, uh, two Jews have three uh, ideas and three uh, decisions, everything is all right, but we are one nation. And I, I just heard like a, a very meaningful uh, like interview with one of the uh, most severe wounded uh, uh, soldiers from uh, Gaza. Someone like about my age, a little bit more, like he's 44 years old with five kids. He's the son of uh, Rabbi Medan, Elisha Medan. Maybe some mm -hmm. of you heard the name. Uh, so I just like lately heard a, a magnificent, uh, unfortunately, I think it's only in Hebrew, interview, long interview with him. And and he admitted like he, he was speaking like from his heart. He's an amazing, incredible man. I, I haven't known him personally. I contacted his wife uh, after he was injured to give some support to some of my friends that uh, connected me to him. And he was saying that, that, that pre-October 7, he was like in the right wing and he was fighting for ideology of the Yudav Shomron and stuff. He said, I still believe in those stuff, but I will never make them something to be like, marginalized or fighting with my fellow Jews, fellow Israelis, fellow other, other people from my nation. I, I really took it because it was like not, you know, like um, amplifying to other people what you should do. I was speaking like from a personal encounter, telling us like, uh, like they asked him, this interview asked him, what would you learn from the war? So he said, I'm not talking to other people. I'm talking to myself and this could apply to others as well. It was like said, he was saying like, I'm admitting I shouldn't have done it in uh, paper, but I will never go back to it. Now, if people ask me about those issues, I said, okay, it's a very interesting discussion. We can do it later. First, let's, let's find how do we grow from it? How do we find a right path uh, to come from it? So I think that those um, aspects, those, those uh, motivations, those kind of discussions um, would hold, I think, uh, for long periods. Uh, and I think that the uh, like realization that we could become very marginalized, we can become uh, in a very severe condition by internal uh, forces, would not, won't, but wouldn't be good for any one of us. And reminding us like what was trained after, I think would have some like some uh, significant impacts in, in Israel. To what extent, I don't know, but I'm, 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 I'm in a way like less concerned from, uh, from internal issues as I was before the war. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes we have to get like those uh, extremely hard conditions only to remember ourselves that we are all part of uh, one nation. Um, I have less thing to say about what is going to happen like in the world. Uh, I mean, anti-Semitism, I mean, I'm sure you know about it a lot more than myself. I live now in Toronto, so I can like, hear a bit about it a little, a little bit more. I, won't, I wouldn't say Toronto is like a center of anti-Semitism, although it was like 
Um, and from what I hear from my friends here, that it was uh, conceived as one as like a very peaceful uh, immigrational area, that you know, all like um, very, very comfortable for immigrants and uh, like people are very polite and that. And we see again and anti-Semitism rises again. Uh, but I also see that I know like many people that are, are like less related to the Jewish nation and like kind of like became more um, involved in the, in the community in the, the local communities and not in the Jewish communities, kind of like stick back to their um, uh, to their nationality to the Jewish nation and and become more involved in other stuff. So I so I see also like those things. Then it is worrying definitely and those anti-Semitism. Uh, uh, events in multiple uh, colleges, cities, it, it is concerning. Uh, but I, I think it's like it's a wake up uh, call uh, for both the like the world leaders, but especially for the Jewish nations for the, in the diaspora, uh, trying to find like the the ways, uh, not only like to run through what things are going, but this is time like to stand up and and I hear it and every time I admire it how people stand up in their communities, in the local places, and say, we, have to, we stand with Israel. And I think it, it is something that will have impact on the long run. May I ask a technical question? Yes, of course. Um, I <laughs> coincidentally just finished reading Tim O'Brien's book on the things they carried, which is about the Vietnam War. Um, in reading your book, you reference the maps um that that were how they were black and white or color or how up to date they were or actually they weren't um my question is does the army still today the idea use these written maps or do you use tablets and other kind of electronica it's just a technical question okay, saying, okay. so for, for one thing I, I can say it i mean i, I know from my friend but I, I'm, I'm not currently fighting in the idf but uh there are some like still uh, like uh, printed maps, but uh, otherwise, like there was like a, like a amazing uh, tech, tech that was implanted in the even in the infantry uh, 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 troops that I hear some some of my friends like amazing stuff that you cannot even imagine. Like you close the loop with uh, like a, a platoon commander with the company commander can close the loop with the air force killing a terror. It's uh, uh, really like science uh, fiction. Uh, some of the stuff there. And you know many of the things that are implanted now in Gaza actually were never uh, tried in any other warfare in the past. Uh, my my wife's cousin was severely injured uh, in a hostage as uh, released, which, which failed unfortunately. His officer in Seret Matkal, but they like implanted like uh, very sensitive newly technology, underground technology, how to fight in uh, in the under uh, an underground uh, era. Um, they succeeded like they, they killed 30 terrorists there it was like a very uh, uh, it was a very good operation only the only thing is that by, by intelligence the hostages were just moved two hours earlier from, to a different place so they missed the, the hostages but uh, they were significantly uh, killed 30 terrorists six of them were injured from outside but using this amazing technology so definitely the idf has uh, implement, implemented like amazing stuff and and i'm sure i only know only partly because some of them you know like are very secured highly classified and you cannot even talk about it on the phone so i think the idf is doing really really well from that uh, perspective your 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 message going back to your message of i'll call it optimism or quasi-optimism of a better sense of unity in Israel, hopefully going forward, and hopefully some return in the Gola, people returning, you know, to their core values. I'm not talking from religious perspective. I'm just staying with the nationalistic perspective. I, I, I hope it continues and it helps us all to move forward in the difficult times ahead. Um, anybody else have any comments or questions uh, to add to this amazing? A rendition. I, I want to say one thing about maps because there's this wonderful passage in Asael's book, which he talks about the need for connection to Eretz Israel, and he has uh, three points. So, so the first one we all know from Avram Avinu, Kum So he says you do it with your feet, and then he says you do it with tarbut. And I didn't mention in the introduction uh, with culture, 
But um, but um, uh, Asiya wrote a book called Lo Darcheh um, about his, his grandfather in, in Vilna. And that connection of the land and the desire for the land, I suppose, would be that second piece. But the third, and I think about it every time I'm in Eretz Israel and I open up a map, I think about, he said, well, you have this connection with maps. There's this love of maps that sort of runs through the book. And, you know, uh, it's like one step beyond Avram Avinu. This is a Rashi, actually, which says that, that there were maps uh, used in the, um, uh, as the Jews were going through the wilderness. But, I, but, but, you know, but the idea of a map as a way to, to, to understand the importance of Eretz Israel's contours, its geography, its mountain, it's just, you, this love of maps is just extraordinary in the, in, in the book. Um, I, I want to thank I, I want to thank Asael for for coming and or not coming but for zooming <laughs> and uh, we really appreciate it. it was very very moving and uh, thank you thank you very much this has been extraordinary mm -hmm. and moving as Stephen put it <clears throat> good evening to everybody thank you all of you. <laughs>